I just want you to know if you're new here and people aren't friendly, we do not claim them. We only claim the friendly ones, uh, but we're so excited to have each and every one of you guys here. We've been in a really good series on, entitled The Holy Spirit, and I want you to know this pastor's proud of you. I'm proud of the church for several reasons. One of you, you're getting uh, a depth of the Holy Spirit that's causing you to question in a good way. Uh, 1 Thessalonians says, test everything. And so it's important for us as believers to have open and honest conversations about what we're preaching about and having scriptures about. And I want you to hear me, questions aren't bad. Questions are actually a good sign that you're digging into what the Word of God has for you. And so, you know, listen, if you listen to everything that I say without checking it, that's a cult, not a church. Come on, somebody. <laughs> And so you go to the Word of God and you dig in and, and you have conversation and you call your pastor and said, you said what? And then I tell you, here's what my experience is and here's what the Word of God says. And, and listen to me, all of us, all of us should be pursuing what's in here more than anything. And I think there's, there's some, some things that we need to consider as we start this message today. First and foremost is, it's often neat, neater in our Christian walk to not deal with the complicated things in Scripture or the things that we don't know about because it makes our Christianity fit in a box. But the problem with Christianity that fits in the box is it doesn't reach people outside the box. That's a good word, Pastor. Shake the tree, somebody. And so these spiritual gifts that God gives to the church, the words of knowledge that happened last week. Were you guys here last Sunday morning? What an incredible expression of God's just power at work in people's lives, those words of knowledge that came forth and people said, Pastor, that's me and coming down to an altar and God touching them and confirming things in their life. What an incredible thing. Now, sometimes the spiritual gifts that are in operation because they're new, they can cause you to question. And again, questioning is okay because why? The word of God says that we test everything. We don't just take it for face value or we just take it for granted. But I'm thankful that we have a church that cares about what's in here. We care about what's in the Word of God. And so we've been on this journey together. And I want to make sure that you understand at the front of this, this lesson teaching today that you hear some of the vital things that the Holy Spirit's been saying to the congregation and to the church. One is, is that there's no second-class Christians. When you get filled or when you get saved and God... God, what the Bible describes as, as having this born again experience, when you, the dead man is gone, the old man is gone, and you, you've created a new life in Christ Jesus based upon your belief and confession, the Holy Spirit gets deposited into you to the brim, to the top, to the fullest. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, as we believe, is when the Holy Spirit comes and allows that Holy Spirit that's to the brim inside of you to go to a place of overflowing. What an incredible thing that is. And so listen to me, you're not a second-class Christian if you haven't operated or don't even know what it means to operate in the spiritual gifts and or God giving you your personal prayer language. It's important for you to know that there's no second-class Christians. It's also important for you to know that just because there's an invitation for more doesn't mean that you're less. One of the greatest lies that happens in the body of Christ when, the, when a pastor or someone tells you that there's more the enemy wants to speak to you and tell you that because you haven't experienced those things or have an understanding of those things, that you're less. Look to your neighbor and say, you're not less. You're not less. God has a perfect plan for you, and he loves you. Listen to me. He can't love you any more than he loves you right now. What an incredible thing that is. And so to know that when we talk and we, we provoke you and we, we entice you and we, we talk to you about scriptures that talk about the more in Christ, don't allow the enemy to, to confirm in you the insecurity that you're less because you're not less. God loves you exactly where you're at. God loves you. He, he knows the questions that you have even before you're asking them. And so what an incredible thing it is to be able to have not just him to the brim, but to him overflowing. And that's what we've been chatting about. We've been chatting about what the Holy Spirit in fullness looks like in our lives. So I want you to give Jesus the biggest round of applause because we're chasing after him today. What an incredible thing that is. And so we've, we've spent some weeks talking out of Acts chapter 2 about the 13 characteristics of a Holy Spirit-driven church. And I will tell you that the Pentecostal Spirit-filled churches 
can emphasize some giftings over the others. And we've been guilty of that for sure. The Bible talks about in Corinthians that he would rather us prophesy than speak in tongues. And then he says at the end of it that I don't forbid speaking in tongues, but I want you to know that I would wish that all would prophesy. Prophesy means to what? Speak on behalf of God. The Bible says in the book of Acts that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Come on, somebody. That, not just talking to the sons in the room, we're talking to the daughters in the room. All you women of God, the Bible says that you can speak on behalf of God. What an incredible promise that that is. And so we want to try to bring a, a, the proper tension because if you're not careful, you'll walk over to this side of the, of the doctrinal s- statement or your, your belief system and you'll say, well, the spiritual gifts are confusing and I don't understand them, so therefore we shouldn't even operate in them. That's not right. And then you can go on the other side of the spectrum where the Bible says, when Judgment Day, ready for this one? Many on that day will say, Lord, Lord, didn't I? Didn't I prophesy? Didn't I do mighty works? And what is he going to say? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, because I never knew you. So we, we have to be careful that we don't chase signs and wonders. We ought to be careful that we don't just shun signs and wonders. The answer is what? We chase him. One of our core values is Jesus at the center of it all. If what we're experiencing in church is taking our eyes off of Jesus what I will tell you is that that's not the goal of Scripture. But when the spiritual gifts are in proper operation, what ends up happening is is we take a pointy finger and we point to Him because He's transformed lives. If He's ever transformed your life, one more time, give Him a big round of applause. That's incredible stuff. We're thankful for it. And so I, I want you to know that just because there's an invitation for more doesn't mean that you're less. And that doesn't mean that all of us in the church, I think what what our what our culture is teaching us, the political landscape, where America is at, where our world is at. The Bible talks in the last days that there is going to be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise up against nation. The way that that actually in the original talks about is people group in the nation will rise up, rise up against people group in their own nation. That when you look at the landscape of our world, you're not just seeing nation rising up against nation, America versus someone else. You're seeing America rise up against America. And there is such disunity in, in lands all over our nation. And what, is, what should that tell you? Jesus is coming back really soon. Normal's not coming back. Jesus is. And so you have to understand the, the, the time that we're living in, it's urgent for you to walk in the fullness that God has for you and to understand that the Holy Spirit overflowing you has really nothing to do with you. It has to do with the world that needs to be reached around you. So one of the greatest tricks that the enemy will play is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you'll, you'll, you'll look at it from your own lens. Well, what about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? Well, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. And the whole time you have to understand the Holy Spirit baptism is not about you. It allows you to be a power, to be a witness to the world that's around you. And if your lens of Christianity is on self and not on others, may I just, just lightly come in and make a sandwich in your kitchen this morning and step on some toes? If consumerism defines your Christian walk and the lens of self, you, you're, you're not following the gospel that's in this book. Our life is to be laid down. Our life is to be a floor mat so people can come wipe the ugly stuff on their life off of us and go to Jesus. That should be the hope. And You guys track with me today. All right, so that was my, that was my introduction to this important lesson that I'm going to be teaching you guys today. And the subject I want to read about is do not quench the Spirit. Numbers chapter 11, verses 26 through 30, gives us a context of a scripture and a story in the Old Testament that's going to land us in a few moments in 1 Thessalonians. Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 through verse 30, reads this. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to them and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested upon them, they began to prophesy. What does prophesy mean? To speak on behalf of God. What an incredible, humbling experience that is 
when God uses you as a messenger of his word. If you've never had the opportunity to win or lead someone to Jesus, what a humbling thing that is. The power of the Holy Spirit on your life to a place of overflowing allows you to be an incredible witness to do the greatest thing that you can do is to lead someone to Jesus. They begin to prophesy. And, and some translations say, and they cease not. Or other translation says, and they didn't add anything to what God was saying. What an incredible statement that is. That, that God was speaking so much that as fast as they could listen, they would speak, but they made sure that their flesh didn't add something that God wasn't saying. Isn't that a picture of what the American church has become? Like we, as preachers, we try to help God. The picture of when the Ark of the Covenant was falling and that man went to lift up the Ark of the Covenant to try to help, help the, 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 the symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit. What happened to that man? He died. Isn't that, isn't that what we've tried to do as the American church? Well, we've got to help God. We've got to make God more palatable. We've got to make him more comfortable. We've got, to, we've got to make sure that our services are like this or the preaching's like this and we don't mention things. at the No, the Holy Spirit's got this. We just got to get out the way. You preach the gospel. You pre preach sin is real, hell is hot, heaven is real, God's love is for you, and he can transform your life. And if you get out of the way, the born-again experience is an incredible thing that happens in the lives of those that are alive in Jesus. What an incredible thing that is. But they, they cease not in doing it. Verse number 26. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those that were registered, but they had not gone out of the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, these two men are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. Anytime God begins to do something new, even the church leadership gets scared. There's a reason why the spiritual gifts aren't on operation in a lot of churches. You know why? Because there's a lot of training and teaching that has to go along with it. You know, it's not just rested on one man and one woman. It's not just rested on the pastor or the lead pastor and what we've created church to be. It's supposed to be a body ministry. It's supposed to be all of us doing our part, fitly framed together to do what God's called us to do. It's a lot of work. And then you have people that are learning how to step into their gifts and they make mistakes. <gasps> do you guys ever make mistakes? Does pastors ever, does, does, did Joshua make a mistake here? I think, you know, I don't, mistake is probably a harsh word, but I think Joshua was doing what he was trying to be taught to do, which was honor and reverence what he was told. But he didn't even perceive that God was doing something new. And here's what Moses said to Joshua in verse number 29. Are you jealous for my sake? Or, or when God does, begins to do something new, what ends up happening is people go, what about me? What about my place? What about my standing? And, and Moses was telling Joshua, listen, God's got you. There is no one that can replace you in the body of Christ because you are unique and wonderfully made as, as a person that, that God is going to use. Here's what he says. Would that all that the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them, and Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. This morning, again, I want to speak to you for the next few moments on the subject, do not quench the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The people of God were stuck again. The Bible in context tells you in this passage of Scripture that a spirit of complaining had broken out. You know, complaining at its core is a sign of unbelief. And unbelief always leads to spiritual death. I believe that they were indeed frustrated that the journey was taking longer than it needed. The years of slavery under Pharaoh had taught them, trained them that comfort and convenience were easier than conviction and advancement. A journey that should have only took days took years because they weren't willing to be obedient to the things of God. Some of them, multiple times, went to Moses and begged them to return to captivity. Freedom was promised, but they felt their life was easier under captivity. Some think that freedom, uh, because it's promised, is then free. But freedom is definitely not free. 
Our freedom was paid and purchased by the greatest act of surrender and victory the world has ever known because Jesus is freedom. What he did on that cross, what he did on that tomb allows us to walk in ultimate freedom. If you're thankful for the freedom that's found in Jesus, give him a big round of applause this morning. We're thankful for it. The wilderness trains and disciplines hearts. It always has and it always will. But perpetual wilderness are signs that lessons are not being learned. You know, stuck is a frustrating place to be. It wasn't just the people. You know that complaining and unbelief is contagious? And if you're not careful, you'll cause your complaining and unbelief to transfer to those that are around you? But so is faith and advancement. So what kind of contagion are you spreading? Are you spreading the contagion of complacency and complaining and unbelief or faith and advancement? Do you believe as the spies believe that you can do it or that the giants were too big? The Bible says that this complaining spirit even touched their leader Moses. He's complaining to God and scripture says that God's anger kindled greatly towards Moses. Moses' cry ended in a request to God in this, in this story. The burden of the people, he says, is too great for one person to handle. Jethro, we read in Scripture, Moses' father-in-law had already given him the warning. Moses, you can't do this by yourself. How many know that you can't walk this Christian road by yourself? That's why the Bible says don't forsake coming together. It's why the Bible talks about the importance of corporately coming together because iron needs to sharpen iron. Self-realization is a beautiful thing. If you think that you're going to have victory and victory in your life over and over again, walking this road alone, you were never meant to be alone. God says to Moses, I will raise up 70 men and there will be a transference or an impartation of spirit. The spirit that I've given you is going to jump off of you and it's going to go to them. And I want you to know there's not a diluting of God's spirit. You cannot dilute the power of God. It's not like he diluted it and said, Moses, what you have in 100%, I'm going to spread evenly over 70. No, because God's spirit does not dilute, it only multiplies. There's not just enough for the pastor, there's enough for you. There's not just enough for the Christian who's been a Christian for 40 years, there's enough for you right now. If you are a new believer in this room, God's power is full and sufficient enough for you to experience him in your fullness. What an incredible promise that is. There is enough for you. Look to your neighbor and say, there is enough for you. There's enough for you. Scripture records how it happens. Numbers 11 verses 17 says this, I will come down and talk with you there and I will take off the spirit which is upon you and will put it upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people. Notice that the spirit of God, I want you to listen, notice that the spirit of God's purpose was not for them, it was to bear the burden of other people. And oftentimes the reason why we don't walk in the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the characteristics of the Holy Spirit is because our Christianity has become about us and not others. Are you tracking with me this morning? We have to get rid of the consumerism that's found in the American church. Well, am I comfortable? How, how do my kids like it? Those things are important, but they're not more important than you understanding why God has given the church the Holy Spirit. It's because He wants to use you to speak on behalf of Him. Then the Bible says in Numbers eleven twenty five, 25, it happened. Look to your neighbor and say, it happened. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke unto him and took of the Spirit that was upon him and gave it to the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Let me give you some observations from Scripture about the Holy Spirit in action in this story. The Holy Spirit causes persons who are underneath His influence to prophesy. Many of you, you've been under the, under, under the influence of other things. Don't look right now. Don't look at your spouse. Don't look at your friend. But when you are under the influence of something, you say and do things that you probably have a lot of regrets for. Come on, somebody. But when you're under the influence of the power of God and you begin to speak on God's behalf, you have no regrets. Some of you used to like to dance with the lights down at the club because you were ashamed of who you were dancing with or you didn't think they were very pretty. I'm thankful that in church we could have the lights on and dance because we got a God that we're not ashamed of. Come on, somebody. It's an incredible thing. 
Again, to prophesy simply means to speak on behalf of God. The promises are found in the New Testament. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. If you are a son and daughter of God, God desires you to be so filled with His Spirit that you begin to speak on His behalf to the world that you're trying to reach. Husbands, as the leaders of our home, the Holy Spirit should be so in you, so on you, so around you, that when you lead your wife and you lead your children, that you're able to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, lead your families well. I'll never forget, I'm picking my son up, Jaden, from, from a Christian school uh, where we came from in Vacaville, and he gets in the car and there's a weight on him. You guys understand sometimes when you, you, can, you just know something's off with your family? And I remember leaning over to him, he was in junior high, and he said, he said, Dad, how do I know that the God that we serve is the real God? And the moment that he asked me that question, it's like the Holy Spirit gave me revelation on where the question came from, which teacher gave it to him, and how to combat that. Just in an instant. Because he does things like that. Because when the Holy Spirit's a part of your life and in leading, if you'll listen to that voice, he's a chatterbox. And I remember, I remember looking at Jaden and going, well, why did so-and-so tell you that? And why did he do that in that class? Do you think that he's got some things in his, in his past where he's maybe answered, you know, prayed towards God and maybe he's got some disappointments in his life? And Jaden looked at me like, how did you know where that came from? <laughs> Son, the Holy Spirit has got you. He's your protector. He's your guider. He's going to give you the ability to ask questions. God's not mad at you because you asked the question. You can ask all the questions in the entire world, but the Holy Spirit is that person that, that if He rests upon you and in your life, He will lead you in all truth. So when the Spirit of God rested upon them, they became conduits of what God was speaking. And the Bible says again, they did not see. So let me give you four observations really quick about this passage of Scripture and the Holy Spirit in our life. One, He is always willing to talk. He's a chatterbox. If you will just tune your inner ear, not these earlobes, but you will tune this inner ear to what he's saying in your life, the Holy Spirit will guide you in all truth. One of my, one of my friends that I, I worked with at my last church, she would say to me, it's good when you teach new believers um, a couple keys. One, if, if you are asking if what, what just happened or a thought that just happened or a, a, a word that got spoken on the inside of you is from the Lord, you know that your flesh wouldn't tell you to go pray for somebody. Your flesh wouldn't, your flesh wouldn't want to go reach out, talking to, talking to somebody, right? Because that's not of the flesh. Um, good ideas that, that are talking about reaching other people all of the time with proper motive come from the Holy Spirit beginning working in your life. It's one of the ways that you can begin to learn to hear God's voice. When you're going through the grocery store and you have this prompting in your heart to go pray for somebody that you don't know. That place where that prompting comes from is a, is a special place in the inner ear of your heart. Well, if you listen, those promptings happen all of the time. What an incredible thing that is. But you got to know that he's a chatterbox. Two, you have to know people, including leadership, people like Joshua, will try to stop his voice coming from new places, not because Joshua was wrong, but because the new and the unfamiliar is always uncomfortable to the established and the familiar. You mean God can use me? Someone that's new in the faith? Someone, that's, someone that, that has never really been in church leadership or had a Bible study? Listen to me. The moment that you give your heart to Jesus is a moment that you can start being used to impact people for eternity in a great way. Flesh fears that their place will be lost if something new comes along. The truth is, nothing can take your place. But we read in Scripture here in a few moments that the new or the prophesying must always be tested. The third thing I want to observe about this is where you're at, he is wanting to speak through you. You know these two men? They couldn't even get to the tabernacle to begin to speak on behalf of God. What does that tell you? That God wants to use you exactly where you're at. At your job, at your workplace, in the grocery store. Come on, somebody, you're getting quiet on me right now. You getting nervous? You getting a little insecure? No, because the Holy Spirit, it's not about you. It's about the people that you're, you're called to reach. Four is this. We know that what was only accessible to the few in the Old Testament is now accessible to whosoever because of what Jesus did on the cross. When that veil was torn in two, 
It gave us access to the things that were inaccessible to almost everybody else. You have access to the Spirit of God and you can now speak on behalf of God. Let me fast forward to the New Testament instructions to the early church. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 19 says it this way. Do not quench the Spirit. Quench, or the word in the original literally means to extinguish. Do not extinguish the Spirit. I'm going to ask a question here that maybe is new to you, but when I read Scripture, these are the kinds of questions that I ask. How can the Spirit of God, as powerful and alive it is, be extinguished? How is it that the instructions of 1 Thessalonians 5 and 19 to the church in Thessalonia, how is it that the writer Paul was saying, be careful that you don't extinguish the Spirit of God in operation in you? How is it that the Spirit of God, who we all believe is powerful and alive, how is it that a church can limit the limitless? How is it that a church can put parameters on the Holy Spirit who's alive and active? This particular body of believers, if you read further, was quenching what God was doing by not allowing prophecies or people to be able to speak on behalf of God. It's interesting to note that tongues, as we've been talking about for the last 12 or so weeks, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes in Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, you got to be careful that that's not the gift that you land on. It's not the most important gift. Prophesying is actually the thing that he would rather you do. But it also says at the end of Corinthians 14, don't forbid speaking in tongues. So I want to just, just pause right here because there's been a lot, of, a lot of questions and the difference between our personal prayer language that we're able to pray when we intercede and, and we pray. The Bible talks about speaking mysteries only known to God versus what happens corporately when we speak in tongues. Those, as we speak corporately, the Bible tells us that there needs to be an interpretation. That is 100% correct. Because why? It is important that when you speak in tongues or you corporately speak in tongues, that there's an interpretation. And I don't know if you've ever been part of these services where someone gives an interpretation in tongues. It's like a holy hush hits the congregation. And it's almost like a call to attention because God's about to speak. The Bible says that tongue is not even a sign to the believer, but it's to the unbeliever. Oftentimes, those of us that have been in church for a long time, when, some, when something starts to happen, when it comes to a spiritual gift, you know what we do? Well, what about all the visitors? They're probably going to get freaked out. No, the Bible says the gifts in operation are a sign to the unbeliever, not to the believer. Again, how are we trying to help God? That's a good question, isn't it? We're trying to help God. God, we got to make this thing so palatable, we've got to chew their food down for them, because what we need to do is we need to like baby food them because they really can't handle the truth. No, really what it is, it's the people that have been in the church in survival mode can't handle the moving of the Spirit because God is trying to move them from a place of doubt to faith, from a place of complacency to a place of confidence to know that God has something for His body. What an incredible thing that is. And so we can read in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Corinthians 14, 26, and I do believe that the Pentecostal Spirit-filled church has put an emphasis on tongues, and it's almost like you begin to speak in tongues and that's it. And I've always said this from this pulpit. Listen, I don't care if you speak in tongues if you gossip in English. Come on, somebody. I mean, you could have all the great gifts and power that God wants for your life, but if you're not kind and gentle and have self-control... People are going to look at you and go, you claim to be what? So look to your neighbor and say, be nice. Don't gossip. Be a decent human being. Don't talk about the pastor over lunch today. <laughs> only, good, only say good things. All right, we're good? All right, we're good. All right, we're good. It's important that you know the difference, though, between our personal prayer language and what happens corporately. But that doesn't mean that we have to walk around in fear if we want to pray in our personal prayer language in the prayer room or on the front row or doing worship, we, we have a freedom in Christ that He's given us. So what happens in the case of Joshua began to happen in the early church. 
Instead of silencing the gifts, though, Paul began to train people up in the gifts. I want to just pause here and say this. If you can't be trained, first and foremost, by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, then the church has a bigger problem than the absence of the gifts. It has an absence of righteous people who love instruction. If your way must be the right way, or you can't be taught or trained, then what you have working in you is not the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, it's the righteous person who loves instruction. So if you want to be part of the fellowship of the kingdom of God, hold on, this even applies to pastors. Because I'm going to get it wrong sometimes. Everyone go, oh man, pastor, you know, he's got to be perfect. There's going to be times when I get things wrong. There's going to be times when I'm studying scripture and I didn't consider another scripture. But that's where iron sharpens iron. That's where we come together as the body and the, and the pastor gift and the teacher gift and the apostolic gift and the evangelist and, and the fivefold ministry gift comes in, in together and we iron sharpens iron. Because the number one rule of maturity you must learn is to love correction. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 through 22. Let's read it in full now. But do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So the question this morning is, is why would church leaders stifle prophecy? Why would those church leaders be scared of what God was saying? I, I think the reasons are fairly obvious from my seat. Maybe it could cause uncontrolled chaos. Maybe it can cause confusion. There's no more uncomfortable moment in a church service when I'm sitting there and someone in the congregation comes up to me and says, Pastor, I feel like the Lord's telling me to tell something to the congregation. Do you know why that should be uncomfortable for me? Because in those moments, I have to discern what is for God and what is for our congregation. What is for the teaching and edification of that person versus what is not stifling or despising prophecies like happened in this church in Thessalonia. And so what we have to grow into, we have to grow into a mature body that if someone besides pastor or someone that you don't know grabs this microphone because the Holy Spirit's leading them, one is you listen with grace. You don't listen with judgment. And not to always think that everything that comes from this microphone is going to be 100% truth. It should be corrected. If I'm doing my job, I should come after someone. If someone says something that's not biblical, I should come up and say, hey, I think our, our dear sister or dear brother got this thing wrong and we're going to work with them. But to say that we're going to despise prophesying or, prophes or speaking on behalf of God, the Bible says that is what causes the spirit to be quenched. Do you know what was so beautiful about today is my wife, who's our worship leader, is sitting on the front row. Where's Elise at? Is Elise in the, in the building? I just want you to know, sweetheart, you did an incredible job today leading worship. Isn't that incredible? I know that you had like this whole thing planned out with one fast song that was going to go to at a half of a bridge and someone cut you off and then you did the fast song after the, after the welcome and I watched you and no one else watched you. No one else knew what was going on, but I watched you with such grace be able to work and operate in your spiritual gift of leading a congregation in worship and no one knew about it and the fact that you just gave God everything that you were today. What an incredible thing that is. And that people like Elise and interns that are going to be here, they're not going to get things right all of the time. But to listen in grace and to be able to walk in maturity and to know that God is going to, going to create in us a body that's not just going to create a celebrity pastor. Who wants that? No one wants that. But to be a body where we can grow uh, fitly framed together to glorify Him is what we're after. If you believe in that, give Jesus one big round of applause. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable being the person that has the, the, the hand on the faucet, as it should be. It is a huge job and a huge responsibility not to despise the working of God in our midst corporately. I remember growing up in a church where someone would begin to prophesy. In, in, in the olden days, we used to just you know, let people prophesy wherever they sat, and they would just say, this is what the Lord says. And there was a time where that was allowed in, in, in decency and in order. Now today, if something like that happens, people will be like, what is going on? Um, and there's no really instructions on Scripture on how we're supposed to prophesy. Are we supposed to prophesy in the middle of a worship song when it gets low? Is, are we supposed to go talk to pastor? Are we supposed to just grab the microphone and do it ourselves? 
There's really no instructions other than to be in decency and in order, correct? It says that with two or three prophesying, like we don't want a thousand people prophesying at the same time uh, because it just gets confusing. You're like, who am I supposed to listen to right now? But what it gives you is this active ability to know that God doesn't just speak to the person that has the microphone. That God wants to speak through you. That if you will just tune the inner ear of your heart and your life, you were on assignment. God has somebody this week on assignment just for you. There's a family member. There's a friend. God will put it in my There's many times I'll wake up in the morning and God will put someone on my heart. And it's a matter of an hour. I'm giving them a phone call just checking on them. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, when we're on assignment, our life becomes less about us and more about others. But the instructions were, as you're learning or as you're growing or as you're as you're not despising prophecies, what is, it, what is the instructions? Test everything. You know that not every spirit, presence, or atmosphere you come in contact with in the church is the Holy Spirit? One of the first things that you need to know as a new Christian is to, is to trust the deposit of God's Spirit inside of you and test, and test everything. So um, there's this phrase that I use. This phrase that I use is we're going to give altar calls at this church. Someone came up to me several weeks ago and said, where is altar call in Scripture, in the New Testament? And I paused and I go, that's a really good question. Because I know, being in the church, that altar call means an opportunity to respond to what God's doing in the moment. Billy Graham would give an altar call and the, the, the floodgates would, would fill and people would come forward. And like, So those of us that have church vernacular down, we know what altar call means, Correct that we're going to give people an opportunity to respond. But you know the word altar call never is mentioned in the New Testament? And so I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good lesson for me to know that we need to be able to test everything. So we know that there was altar calls or, or response times in Scripture. Peter gives that sermon after Acts chapter uh, 2, 3,000 people get saved. How do they know that there was 3,000 people that got saved? Because they had to have like call someone forward and the yes team, you know, the Holy Ghost yes team was there. You know, there was follow up. There was, you know, there was many times that you read in scripture of, of people preaching and a response happening. But vernacular and language is important, isn't it? So to test everything. So how do you test things, Pastor? You test things by the written word of God. You test things by the spirit of God living inside of you. My prayer this morning as I teach this lesson is God increase our discernment. And the third is, is the outcome of what someone has prophesied will be made known. Will be made known. All right. Let's go down the home stretch here. The effects of quenching the Spirit are devastating. I believe the first thing that happens when you quench the Holy Spirit is that you stop transformation and you start preservation. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 says it like this. And we all with unveiled, unveiled face beholding the glory of God are being transformed from glory to glory. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You know, when the Spirit of God is not welcome, the power that transforms is not present. Romans 1 and 16 says it like this, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The opposite of transformation is preservation. And I want you to hear this, Pastor, this morning. Getting by is anti-kingdom of God. We do not serve in a kingdom that shrinks back and is destroyed. We serve in a kingdom that advances and moves on. Hebrews 10 and 39 says it like this. But our way is not that of those who shrink back to destruction. But we are of those who believe, relying on God through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the Amplified Version. And by this confident faith, preserve the soul kingdom that cannot be destroyed. We serve in an advancing kingdom. Do you know that when you allow the spirit of truth to leave or not be welcomed in your life, you begin to follow a lie? Most of the time, people don't want the Holy Spirit in their life because the Holy Spirit in our life is trying to guide us in truth. And sometimes we don't want the truth. We like to follow the lie. 
The moment that the Holy Spirit's not allowed to speak in our lives and through other people in our lives, preservation starts and transformation ends. The Bible says again, says what? We are transformed from glory to glory. I've always told people that I've discipled the most important touch from God that you will ever get is the next one. Because God's not done with you. He's got great plans for you. Here's the second thing that quenching the Spirit of God does. It stops devotion and starts apathy. Can the house of God lie in ruins and the people of God just be okay with it? They can when the Spirit of God in them has been quenched. Do you know that you, the Bible says, are responsible to fan the flame? Listen to what 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says. Paul writing to Timothy. For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame of God which is in you. Paul was teaching this valuable lesson to Timothy. And here's what he was saying. You're responsible for the deposit that God's placed in your life. Not the pastor. Well, I'm not just getting fed there. Paul would say, I remind you, it is your responsibility to fan the flame that was placed inside of you. If you're new here, and the only time that you're getting Scripture is when I'm delivering it, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God that was placed inside of you. If it's been a long time since you found yourself on your knees in your prayer closet, I remind you to fan the flame of the gift of God that's inside of you. If it's a long time since you turned the inner ear of your life to the presence of God, I remind you as your pastor to fan into flame the gift of God that was placed inside of you. If it's been a long time since you've invited someone to know Jesus, I remind you to fan the flame of the gift of God that's inside of you. If it's been a long time since you've seen God working in your life and you've become apathetic and complacent, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God that's inside of you. Because there is nothing, nothing on this earth that will satisfy you as a presence of God and the Spirit of God in your life. I believe that a dynamic move of God is just a breath away. And my hope this morning is that if you're sleeping, wake up, O oh sleeper, and lift up your eyes. Because passion and vibrancy is just a step away. The third thing is this. Quenching the Holy Spirit will stop holiness and start sin. You're either walking by the Spirit or you're walking by the flesh. You don't walk by the sword of Holy Spirit. And in the church, we've created this vernacular, haven't we? Well, it's just compromise. That's another word that's not in the New Testament. Well, I just had a bad week. Maybe so. But when you stop being led by the Holy Spirit in your life, holiness begins to stop and sin begins to grow. His first name, I want to remind you this morning, is holy and his last name is spirit. His first name is not sort of holy or sometimes holy or Sunday holy. We are through the blood of Jesus all the time holy. We are grace in action. When we fall, we get back up again. But holiness lived out will always allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to point out what God doesn't want in our life. Holiness stopped is not compromise. It's sin. I don't want to quench the Holy Spirit in my life. Because I don't want to put in these hands something that doesn't please our Heavenly Father. My life is not my own. The fourth thing, two more. The quenching of the Holy Spirit stops creativity and it starts reality. You ever, ever heard of that phrase, it is what it is? That's not the life of those that are found in the Holy Spirit. You know that the Holy Spirit uh, was used at the beginning in Genesis 1 as an agent of creativity of creation. Do you know that Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, any, any adjective or adverb could have been used to describe, describe God to us to begin with, but what was it described to us as? And God created? 
God wanted to know that his number one attribute to his kids is that he's a creator. So I want you to listen to me. If you're part of a church that's been stuck, is the Holy Spirit active in your life? Or do you know the Holy Spirit's active in your life when there's creative, there's creativity and ingenuity to reach their world active today? So what worked in the 80s and what worked in the 90s and what worked in the 2000s, I'm going to tell you right now, this generation, 22% of this current generation is identifying as LGBTQ. Do you know that the same methods that we use to reach people, young people in the 80s, aren't going to be be used today? Do you recognize the impact? So when, when this next generation tries it all and goes to the end of their selves, how is the church going to open up their arms to them and begin to love them back to a place of restoration and wholeness in Jesus? Is it through judgment, or is the Holy Spirit going to have to give us ingenuity on how to reach a generation that is lost and broken and doesn't know Jesus? One of the most beautiful moments that we've had as a church congregation was a couple weeks ago when when one of our dear friends came up, and she, she was so in despair. And our church didn't shun her, We begin to pray that God's presence and transforming power would come. But the next step is that when people come in like that, that we run to them and not run from them. That we invite them into our tables, we invite them to coffee, we invite them into our lives. Because why? When God is doing something in our midst, transformed lives begin to happen and creativity begins to go crazy. His number one trait From the beginning is creation. Elise, if you would come and start playing behind me, that would be great. You can just maybe get ready to sing How Great Is Our God. That's fine. The fifth and final thing this morning is absent of the Spirit, we stop impartation and start stagnation. Listen to 2 Timothy 1 again. For this reason I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God. Here's the second half of that scripture. Which is in you through the laying on of hands. I want you to hear, hear this, Pastor, especially those of you that are maybe don't are, are new to this expression. It is biblical to have people pray with you and lay hands on you. The Bible says in James, if any of you are sick or suffering, call the elders of the church and they will lay their hands on you and the prayer of faith will save the sick. We have gotten away from from doing things that the Bible says to because why? We have not wanted to offend. And in in our plan to not offend, we've created this in this church or Christian environment that is not what the Word of God says that we're supposed to do. There is power in impartation. And when the presence of God or the anointing of God rests on someone who is Holy Spirit filled, Holy Spirit baptized, you begin to lay hands on people and things begin to break off of their life. It's the impartation. And what I want to just, just, I wanted to come this morning with the lesson. I know we had just an incredible week last Sunday. Words of knowledge, people coming down and getting saved. I wanted to be able to pause. I feel like the Lord asked me this morning to be like halftime at a, at a big basketball event and just have a family talk. And just say, you don't have to be scared about what God's doing. And nor don't allow the enemy to lie to you and say that you're not enough because you are. But there is an invitation by the Holy Spirit to our church for more. And the impartation can happen when I don't, when I stop quenching the Holy Spirit in my life. And I say a prayer sort of like this, Lord, if what this pastor is saying is true, And your word is confirming what he's saying. And I feel in my spirit that there's a drawing for more. If it's from you, I want it. But if it's not from you, I don't want it. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to move me. To move me from where I'm at to where you want me to go. Because I know that you do all things well. And you have to know that that prayer, when the Holy Spirit is involved in your life, goes from me focused to Lord my heart is really not about me, but it's about my lost coworker. 
It's about my family member that doesn't know you. God, would you help me to be a a, a greater witness for you? God, I want to do what you've called me to do. I want to be what you've called me to be. Lord, would you help? And when the Holy Spirit's in the room, we don't have to chase signs and wonders. They chase us. And as we lift up the name of Jesus, or we lift up the name of our Heavenly Father, how great is our God, His presence comes and He begins to draw all people to Himself. Would you stand all across this room? Elise, would you lead us in how great is our God? Hallelujah. Yes. How great is our God? Sing with me how great is our God. All we see how great. Just before I send you that direction, God wants to do something right now in this room. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, Christians praying everywhere. You're here this morning and you hear in your spirit the invitation for more in your life. And maybe you've been out of church for months or years or maybe this is your first time here. 
And you say, Pastor, I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. I'm ready. I want to know what it means to surrender my life to Him. I don't know your story. I don't know where you're at. I know that we had several people last week say yes to Jesus. And this church will always give an invitation. We're always giving an invitation for those that don't know. So Christians praying everywhere. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. You say, Pastor, it's me. This morning, I want to give my heart to Jesus. If that's you, would you stretch up your hand so I can see it? If there's anybody in this room, God bless you. I see I see your hand up there. Hallelujah. Anybody else? As I'm scanning, I see your hand up there. Thank you. Yes, I see your hand, sweetheart. I see your hand, sir. The greatest decision you'll ever make. Young lady, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand right here. The greatest decision that you will ever make is to give your heart to Jesus. Now, indicating that you're wanting to do it and then dedicating your life is what we're after this morning. We're not asking you to join a church. When I say a church in that sense, we're not asking you to join Parkway. We're asking you to join the kingdom and family of God. Parkway, there's seven or eight people that raised their hand. Would you give the Lord a big round of applause this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those of you that raised your hand, we've got some people up here that are part of what we call our yes team. And our, it's a really fancy name that we came up with. It's you just said yes to Jesus. And so there's some people here that want to walk next to you. They want to be able to exchange phone numbers and maybe take you out to coffee and talk about this new faith. But before you get to that step, the Bible says if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that he's Lord, you shall be saved. And so would you bow your heads across this room, close your eyes. Would you repeat this prayer after me and our church family? Would you join us? Say, dear Heavenly Father, this morning, I recognize my need of you. I'm thankful for what your son Jesus did on that cross and how he conquered that tomb. Would you forgive me of all of my sins? I repent. I turn away from everything that I've done wrong. And I run towards you with everything that I have. I can hear heaven right now. The greatest round of applause happens when someone gives their heart to Jesus. So would you say it? Say, help me, Father. I'm new at this, but I know you're drawing me. Would you put people in my life to help point me to you? Would you send your Holy Spirit first and foremost to lead and guide me? As I begin to read the Bible and I begin to have questions, would you send that Holy Spirit to guide me? We thank you for what you're doing because you do all things well. Parkway, would you join heaven this morning and give heaven a big round of applause? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, before you head out that direction, would you try to introduce yourself to someone that you don't know? Maybe slap them high five. I'll see you guys next Sunday. God bless. <laughs>